All financial support for this podcast comes from my patrons on patreon.com. If you'd like to join in with the patrons, please check out patreon.com slash Darwin Gross. That's D-A-R-W-I-N-G-R-O-S-S-E. Now enjoy the podcast. Okay, today I have the uh, great opportunity to speak to somebody uh, whose work I enjoy, who is actually very influential not only to me, but to a number of my co-workers and artistic collaborators. Uh, his name's Mark Fell. Incredible body of work, incredible history of writing. Uh, if you go to if you go to his website, you'll find all kinds of previous interviews and, and writings there, but uh, also just some amazing music. And uh, so with no further ado, let's say hello to Mark. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Hello, Darwin. I'm good, thanks. How are you? All right. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to have this chat. This is, uh, this is really cool. It's really, it's really pretty special for me. I appreciate it. But it's it's always nice to escape from work. So <laughs> yeah. I'm always, if someone wants to do an interview, I'm, I'm usually like saying, "Yeah, definitely." When do you, can we do it now? <laughs> I, I agree completely. That's that's a, that's a great point. Um, so why don't we start off by having you tell people a little bit about uh, what you're currently working on? So I'm currently doing a whole bunch of stuff. What am I doing? So uh, right, actually, right now, the thing that's occupying my mind is. Actually, not mind. My, I'm not supposed to say mind. People think I don't like the idea of a mind. But <laughs> what is what is occupying me is uh, I'm doing some commissions for a, a kind of small ensemble from Oxford and London. So I'm working with a bunch of acoustic performers. Like yesterday, I was in a studio with a, a pianist, and I don't know anything about what pianos can really do, even though I lot, <laughs> like a lot of piano music. So I had like full-on imposter syndrome with this pianist trying to work out what to do. So that's what's been happening. But I've just also finished a book, which is coming out on Urbanomic in, it went to the printer today, actually. So I guess we'll have copies back maybe in a month or six weeks. So that's been a lot of work over lockdown. It's called, sounds like I'm plugging it. I'm not plugging it. No, no, please. I mean, I'm curious now. I, I, I didn't know that this was on the horizon. It's called Structure and Synthesis, The Anatomy of Practice. And it's basically a bunch of collected writings and some new stuff on the subject of the things that interest me are like kind of the relationship between aesthetics and technology and ideology. So it's kind of a bunch of philosophical writings and rants about that, basically. That's really interesting. Is it, is it all your work or is it a collection of many people? It's all my stuff. Uh, <laughs> wow. So kind of like, yeah. But, all, but it's it's kind of like a mishmash of different things. Like I didn't want to make it into too much of a, of a sort of linear tract, you know, like here are these arguments and this is where it leads to. It's more like a kind of sort of crisscrossing of statements and things and drawings and diagrams and stuff. Yeah. And it turned out to be a big piece of work. Like I said to Robin that, the publisher, let's say, for about 200 pages, and it's ended up being 400 pages. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So it's, it's quite a big piece of work. How long and did it take you to put that together? About a year, I think. It's Yeah, it was, yeah, I'd say about a year. Like like the deadline, Robin wanted it off me last December, so December 2020, and I only just finished it. <laughs> <laughs> so he's been really patient. But, yeah, it, it's. I just felt it, you know, I, it needed to be the size it was. It feels really nice to have done that, actually. That's that's amazing. I'm really looking forward to that. That it sounds fascinating, especially since much of your previous writings have sort of like played around the edges of this. Particular discussions of, of structure is is something that has always kind of been mm. been a uh, something you've talked about as well as was has always been an important part of your music. Mm. I guess a lot of my thoughts about technology are kind of modeled on or sort of borrow from or appropriate positions from the philosophy of language. So I'm kind of really, when I first think out of Wittgenstein, when I was, I never studied philosophy at university, but I did A-level philosophy, which is like 
what you do before you go to university. And that's when I started to encounter philosophy of language. And so, yeah, a lot of my kind of ideas about technology are sort of drawn from that and a kind of critique of romantic beliefs about technology that it's just a kind of ideally a passive vehicle mm-hmm. through which things are expressed. That's the kind of what what happened was actually when I was a student before I went to university, I was messing around in a video edit suite at the local college. It's actually about 50 meters from where I am now. I've not <laughs> moved very far. <laughs> and and so I was in this kind of local college that you go to before you go to university. And the guy in charge was he was not a fan of experimental work, basically. So I was in, you know, I was like 17, 18 years old and I'd got access to this video edit suite and decided just to repatch it, you know, just to like see what happens. Like, oh, I can, you know, if I I can and thought, yeah, if I unplug that from there, what's going to happen if I plug that into there and root that? You know, that's my way of working. And the guy in charge came in and he was really angry. He was angry because I'd made a mess of his video edit suite. Mm. But what he said was, if you don't have an idea, you'll just be like doing what the technology dictate, dictates, you know. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, his position was like, if you don't know what you're going to do, then you're just going to be doing what the technology determines. And he framed it in terms of this opposition between your authorship and the technology. And, I, you know, I was just a young kid at this point, but and it really got to me like this is completely wrong this not this equation isn't what i it's not what i feel you know that there's this opposition between me the author and the technology because all my you know i'd been using synthesizers for years at this point all my work was about just fiddling around and see what came out of that you know right so that kind of problem stuck with me yeah it's uh it's funny because I, I see where I see where this person was coming from because having you know I I spent some time teaching in an art school, and one of the things that was really kind of depressing was when people like wanted to do something, so they would start off in Photoshop by dropping down the filters <laughs> list and seeing what there was, you know. Yeah. yeah. But um, in a way, it's you're you're making a great point, which is that there is there's a practice there to be had, which is doing that exploration and figuring out what speaks to you, and that becoming that that also being an artistic expression. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I take your point about the Photoshop filters, but like, if I'm honest. When I first got Photoshop, that's what I was doing. <laughs> right. Oh, <laughs> it's like, know. whoa, yeah, right. like more solarization and let's solarize <laughs> right. the solarization. And let's embossing. Whatever. Oh, no, emboss the other way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's emboss the emboss, you know, and you do it. And then everybody does it. Right. And then you think, yeah, well, but that's not a problem. For me, that's not a problem of the technology. That's a problem about over familiarity of like it becomes, it becomes too you know, saturated in that kind of stuff. Right, right. Um, Boy, we, we kind of jumped off track because I, I did want to find out, are you working on any musical stuff right now? Yeah, so the, the stuff with the ensemble I'm doing right now, right. I'm also quite, maybe two years ago, I went to Buenos Aires and did a, a thing with a percussion ensemble there that I, ne- I kind of resulted in a performance, but... I didn't really like the recording of the performance, so I, I got the ensemble to go back in the studio and record all the bits. So I'm trying to edit that. Um, I was wor- I'm also working on a new electronic record, which I guess you heard the sad news that Peter Rayberg died yeah. about a month ago. So I was like working on a new album for Editions Mega, which was, again, I'd said to Peter I'd deliver it in February, and I was late with that. So I, mm. that's something I've been doing. Yeah, I've got a whole bunch of stuff. I've always got like a million things. Right. Well, and then the other thing is recently I did an interview with you. You had been working on some collaborative stuff. Uh, you and Ryan, Ryan Trainer, your son, uh, have been working together on some performance systems using using Macs and especially using like remote connectivity between uh, between uh, players and between playing groups. Is that mm-hmm. some? Is that? Uh, still in in action for you 
Yeah, so what we did, that came about because we'd gone into lockdown right. and all these festivals were like, oh, can you do some streaming stuff? And I really got really <laughs> super bored of the whole streaming paradigm. Right. And so me and Ryan were like, what can we do instead? Like, And we're like, hang on, what about if we try and figure out a way of using Max so that we can just synchronize parameters over networks? Mm-hmm. And either we can just send a Max patch and control that or we can have like several people all connected together and we we started to do quite a lot of that stuff and it got sort of interesting a lot of a lot of technical problems also a lot of kind of ideological issues and conceptual stuff and aesthetic things all sort of to seem to collide in this activity and it was yeah it was really good and we did some stuff and then we realized actually it was quite a barrier that if we wanted more people to be able to engage with this it was actually quite difficult to say okay now you need to install max and download Mm. these externals and yeah these are the audio we wanted to be able to just get you know people with quite quite limited technical expertise involved so we decided to we made contact with someone who could write it as a website so that's what we did we just did a thing the first thing went live maybe a few weeks ago, which is kind of quite a basic grid-like step sequencer type thing with some algorithmic controls. And that's been really popular, actually. We were really surprised by the amount of people that just visited it and used it. So, yeah, that, that's that been quite an interest. We want to do more of that. You know, that, that was the first one, the kind of quite simple grid-like sequencer, but we want to do more things like that. But it's a case of getting money to do it. Sure. Right. Because we can't program it ourselves, so we have to pro- pay the programmer. And and actually, this is I, I put a funding application into the Arts Council in Britain. So we were asking for like £15,000, which is not a lot of money. That was to pay my fee, Ryan's fee, the programmer, but also to do lots of outreach type work. Right. So actually, my fee was going to be something like £2,000. It was going to be like a hell of a lot of work. And we as artists weren't going to get paid much. And it was a it was a really strong application, you know, and it got rejected. And it, and the thing on the rejection, it said that what we'd like to hear more of is the artistic vision behind this project rather than what is technically capable of. And again, you know, it got rejected on the basis that they assumed because we were using technology, it was just about it was technology. Just a technological demo, right? Yeah. yeah. And where was the artistic vision? Yeah. And like. Well, actually, I don't really have an artistic vision because I, I don't work like that. I fiddle around with technology and, and see what comes out of it. Yeah. Lives it all, you know. Right, right. And, and also, why should I actually, I could use that language to sell the project to these people. You know, I could start to talk about my glorious artistic vision is that I want <laughs> to communicate. But why should I? You know, it's almost like I felt like replying and saying, it's almost like you've asked me to say, how does your project enhance the glory of God? <laughs> you know what I mean, like this hopelessly metaphysical language right. about artistic vision. We're That's shooting right like. back into the 1600s, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, um, how does it? How does it glorify the word of God? Right. Your, how does it? How does it transcend? How do you become one with the angels in the production of this work? You know, what I mean, right, it's right. just this stupid metaphysical language that just is about barriers you know that's what it's about it's about people being gatekeepers and their values determining who and who who gets the cash and and you know we're we're working with the audiences that we're dealing with like like my background of working class kids who aren't particularly engaged with that kind of world you know and and it would have connected with those kids right right so yeah, I was just like, I don't even want to resubmit this application. Yeah, that's, just, that's pretty frustrating, right? Yeah, and I've had it a long, you know. Anyway, so you you brought up this idea of your your background, and one of the things I like doing in my podcast is talking to people about their background and how they got to be the artists and technologists that they they are, and particularly with this idea of how do you how you know at what point did you combine your interest in art and your interest in technology? into sort of like the the combo life that you now live. Yeah. And I'm I'm wondering what your what your story looks like. 
Well, they were never not combined. So like, like my story is that I grew up in the north of England, kind of like my parents taught, kind of brought me up to be critical, basically. So like they brought me up to question and argue and I was trained to be an outsider from the beginning, I guess. <laughs> and then, um, and then the eighties happened. So like I was, I was a young teenager, like 13 at the beginning of the eighties. And in Britain, it was a, in the North of England, it was a terrible place to be because we'd got this horrible political leader called Margaret Thatcher who oh, just decided yes. to, right. it was not a nice place to be, you know, society was falling to bits. The everyone was seemed to be unemployed. It was a, for me, it was like, okay, I've been brought up to have these values about community and about not about greed, about the world not being about greed, basically. And then it seemed to me that that the world was turned into that. And, you know, there was this famous miners' strike, I don't know if you've heard of, called the Battle of Orgreave, uh, was the kind of sort of like uh, climax to it all. Mm-hmm. And that happened... I lived in the village next to where that happened. Oh, so okay. um, there was, it was a time of big political sort of turmoil. And I came across weird electronic music, like things like Throbbing Gristle, Cabaret Voltaire, stuff like this. And that was an alternative world for me, you know? So we're talking like 1980, 81 ish. I got a synthesizer from the next door neighbor who'd got a spe- He was a technician in the university. And he got a synthesizer, he let me borrow it. And it was like, this is amazing. So that was the starting point for me. And then I, I got a computer. I think it was a Commodore 64 computer. I don't know if, did you have those in America? Oh, you bet we did. Sure enough. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I, I did computer science at school. So I got, you know, I learned how to do, we had a, an old Apple, can't remember what it was, Apple computer. I learned basic programming on that. You know, the first things I would do was like, okay, let's make it do loads of flashy colors and stuff. And so my interest in making art and my interest in technology were always part of the same. Always mashed together, yeah. Yeah, I was like, you know, at school, I was on the nerd spectrum sort of, but I was equally, you know, I was an angry kid. Angry Mm. nerd. (laughs) (laughs) I was the angry nerd. Um, And yeah, it just, that kind of, activity of using synthesizers and bits of computers and stuff to do stuff was was what I wanted to do. Yeah, interesting. What was the point at which you went from kind of like being in technology and doing cool stuff with that or fun stuff for you and into saying, well, no, I'm going to be serious about this, uh, you know, and I put that in air quotes in a way, because I, I know that that's always a continuum. But at some point, you, at least like in my experience, I'll, I'll talk about my experience. There was a point where I was like interested in technology, uh, even deep into it. I also had this background in music, but then all of a sudden, you know, I, I found this guy and I started getting kind of obsessive about it, right? Did something like that happen for you? Or was it, uh, or or was it a, a different take? Yeah, I mean, I real what happened was that I got sort of obsessed by the potential of things, and that brought it stopped being fun basically. Mm. <laughs> At some point, like you know, there was the fun side of it, but then it was like, oh right, so there's this difficult side of it that I start to encounter. So I was drawn into it because it was fun. And then it was like, but now it's kind of getting serious. (laughs) It's like, yeah, just like for for me, it was always about how can these things interact, basically? Like, how can this thing interact with this? And also like the interaction of sounds. Like, I remember the first time I I borrowed a Porter studio, you know, like a four track cassette Mm -hmm. off a friend. And And that was the first time I could actually make more than two sounds at once. And I realized as soon as you add a third sound, it actually starts to, it, to, for me, it got really difficult. Like, okay, it's easy to make something with two sounds, but then you add a third sound and it becomes really difficult to, the equation suddenly gets a lot more complicated, you know? Right. And, you know, it became, it switched from like, I'm awake all night having fun 
twiddling these dials to like I'm awake all night and I'm not actually, you know, I'm actually having a trauma, sort of. <laughs> um, and I think, yeah, I think that's quite a common experience, you know. I th- and I think it's a kind of experience that isn't just rooted in like what it's like being an artist, but I think also a lot of my friends who are scientists also describe this kind of thing of like it was really interesting and then all of a sudden it got to be work yeah 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 or it 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 got to be not work in like a kind of oh my god i've got to go to the office and answer telephones but it be, you know it became work as in difficult maybe yeah it yeah. became kind of um you, you're not driven by just pleasure basically right you're driven by the questions that you're dealing with now are you the kind of person that that f- gets motivation in tackling a hard thing? I guess I am actually. I mean, I've always thought that I'm quite lazy. <laughs> but then I'm I'm not but my laziness is like manifests itself in a sort of workaholic sort of attitude. So, yeah, it's kind of like if I'm not careful, I can just be up all night mm-hmm. doing stuff. Not so much these days, but like especially when, you know, like I I think I was quite obsessive for quite a long time. What was your first release? So the first release is secret, and I'm never going to say the name of it because it was absolutely awful. I did two or three <laughs> things. I did two or three things that are like there is no way that I want people to find out about that. <laughs> but um, the first re- serious release that was a thing I did with Matt Steele this this project SND. Yeah. So what what happened was there were a few of us working together, uh, me, this guy, Jez Potter and Matt Steele. And we kind of, the three of us worked together. And then this guy, Russell Haswell, I don't know if you know Russell Haswell. So he's like really, really important British artist. Like the whole, you know, like basically every music scene that, that means something to me, Russell's had a bit of a hand in it. Some, you know, really close friend of Peter Rayberg, really part of that okay. early mega stuff. So Russell got in touch with, Jez, the guy that me and Matt were working with, and said, I want you to do a release for my label, but I don't want any of this kind of like mellow chords and stuff on it. And so Jez said to me, oh, Mark, Russell's interested in this, but like we can't really involve Matt in it because Matt's so into these kind of like lush chords and stuff. So I was like, okay, me and you do this project, Jez. And that became a thing called Shirt Tracks, which was released on Russell's label. And I said to Matt, like, look, Jez has got this offer and I'm going to do it, but he doesn't want any mellow chords in it. So, Matt, me and you, let's start a project. And all it'll be is just the mellow chords right. that Jez doesn't want. <laughs> and Matt became this SND project, which was ironically released before this. Oh, weird interesting. Bit of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, me and Matt made this record, the 12 inch single, and we didn't have, you know, we kind of sell, we actually got a friend. A friend who'd got a company and he wanted to lose money. Actually, he he was like a he was a businessman with an interest in music, and he'd been buying synthesizers and stuff and building a studio through his business, and he needed to make it legitimate by being seen to be trying to doing producing some stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So he said to me and Matt, "Look, I can invest in this record label. I can pay for the record label," and he was assuming it was going to lose money. It was a bit like that that film, The Producers. You know that Hollywood film. <laughs> yes. It was a bit, it was a kind of thing. Accidental success. I'm definitely going to lose money with these guys (laughs) because we we thought that. And then, I mean, we didn't actually make any money, but it was a successful release. You know, it sold. And we were really surprised. Yeah, the motivation was that, like, I'd said to Matt, look, I don't care if it's successful. I don't care. I just, I've just got to make this thing now, you know. And I've got, let's just do three 12 inches. And literally, when, if we can do that, I will die a happy person because mm. it's like I've just I've just done what I wanted to do. And it was really like that. You know, it was like we were so pissed off with everything and, you know, just being in shitty jobs and that kind of thing. So I so we did it and it was like really, you know, it was people liked it. And this label in America, in Frankfurt, sorry, Mill Plateau got in touch and said, do you want to do an album? And that sort of catapulted us, in, us into a, a different world, you know, and that's that's kind of how it started. Right, with Mill Plateau at a time when that was a real influential label, and you were a very influential artist on, on that label. Yeah, I mean, we were, when the guy phoned up, so basically these 12 inches, we'd stamped Matt's telephone number on the 
on the mm-hmm. back of it. This mm-hmm. before we'd not got email accounts and stuff. <laughs> and and Matt's like, this guy I came from Mill Plateau's phone. What is this label? And I was like, oh my god! I was like having a panic attack. <laughs> And I was too scared. Like this is what I was. I was such like a little naive kid. I was like too scared to even answer the phone to this guy. And Matt's like, "Why? What? Why are we going to do? What? We should we do something on this label?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah, let's do it." I guess like what we did was we, you know, there were people that that we took direct influence from. So Thomas Brinkman and Mike Inc. And there was a group called Oval that were doing this kind of mm-hmm. kind of almost like low resolution sort of chopped up stuff. But I guess we kind of sat in the middle of those two things and it just became quite popular. So, yeah, it was it was a big just catapulted us into just a different, you know, even like someone's going to pay for us to go to Frankfurt. Yeah, right. <laughs> was just like, that is <laughs> That's amazing. Big, yeah. That is amazing. We're actually going to, we're going to go on an aeroplane and do something. Now, one of the things that S and D is kind of known for is like long form work, where there isn't a lot of structural change. The change is is like it, it sort of like really attaches to a lot of that uh, kind of minimalist stuff that that Mill Plateau kind of started, and then uh, you know other labels like Raster Noton and some of these others uh, continued with. This idea of long form structuralist stuff where the change isn't in structure, the change is in timbre over time. Was yeah. is that a fair fair assessment or like for the elevator pitch of that? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, like my problem was that so I'd kind of come from this analog synthesizer background. I'd got and then I'd got an Atari computer running Pro 24, then Cubase. Mm-hmm. And what I realized quite soon was that I couldn't really make work in this environment. Like, it, and I didn't realize, you know, for me, it was like, oh, yeah, this is the natural progression. You've got a little mono synth, right. and now you've yeah. got something better. You're getting a, an Atari, and that's better, and you can throw away your mono synth. And I, it never really occurred to me at that time that there's just a very different way of working, and that using a timeline puts you in a certain kind of relationship to your materials. It's very different from using a, a mono synth. I'd be like, yeah, and now we kind of, we'll, we'll put this bit here and we'll have another layer here and yeah, we'll have a drop down here and then we can have like a snare rush here. And and it was all these kind of like bad habits of techno that I was like, why is everything sounding so rubbish? Why is it all just sounding not right? And then, you know, listening to people like Mike Inc and Thomas Brinkman and the basic channel stuff, like I think a really important one for me was M4. You know, it's just this, kind of quite linear thing that just it doesn't have the bad habits of like here's a breakdown and here's a snare roll and this whole thing of like music is just we were getting away from this idea that that music is a a series of layers that kind of came in and out you know it was just like here's one thing and we just let it happen and that's enough and and that for me was a big kind of really important thing of like we can forget those habits and just do this and that's what it was, yeah. Well, and also, I would say with that S&D stuff, a lot of it to me, just a minute ago, you said something about like when you started working with this stuff, uh, once you got more than two sounds, there was like a different thing to it. And I would say with the S&D stuff, it, it's sort of like stripped down to being kind of two sounds, right? Yeah. yeah. And so it changes it, it had to have changed your approach to what we typically think of as, as arrangement because arrangement isn't that important because you're not working, you're not having to like do this puzzle piecing thing of making all the bits fit together, right? Yeah, but the arra- the concern was, it was about the detail of like, how does this rhythmic stuff and these, and these chords, how do they fit together? Mm-hmm. And when you look at it in detail, obviously there's an infinite number of things that you can do to that so we just got drawn into that it's like the minute detail of like duration the duration of like a chord stab like in the and like oh you have a long one then a short one and then the gaps between them and and how does that fit with just a kick and a snare and stuff and and actually that came about from me and matt we had this kind of shared love of like early techno and in particular I came across this producer, Mark Kinchin, who did this thing. I think it was a remix he did with Derek May, this track called Can You Feel It? Actually, I was listening to it the other day. We we dug it out and we both listened to it, me and Ryan. 
and it was just like just the detail of like the duration of this chord and how the duration changes, you know. And when I first heard this record, I actually got it from like the reduced to clear thing of my local record shop. Mm-hmm. So it was a completely random purchase. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this is, at-. I became obsessed with like how these things interlocked, you know, and how you could re, you know, re-interlock them and, and all this kind of stuff. And that's what SND was about. It was like just that real fascination with like, you have this rhythmic st- stuff and this chord stuff and you know we didn't need any chord changes we didn't need any melody and it was just like how do these things lock together and that was where that was what we were dealing you know so we weren't bothered about how does it change over time and is there a crescendo and how does it make people feel and where's the joyous bit it's like (laughs) it's just the riser yeah yeah it's just like oh my god like we're really looking at just like these things of like we can put the kick in this place compared and then put that there. And, you know, it was, it was much more like using something like Lego, but not to make a building, but just to like, look at how three bricks fit together and what you can do with it. And we just got drawn into that. And, you know, I still am really, it's it's like, that's the question that keeps me going, I guess. Yeah, you still are. But one of the things I would say that has happened over the duration is that your, uh, your relationship with time has gotten to be more and more complex over, over, uh, over time. I, I would say, yeah. uh, and, uh, I'm curious about what, what is it, what is it that draws you into not only complex timing, but complex divisions of time, sort of like what would seem like arrhythmic connections along with a rhythmic backbone or stuff like this. Tell me a little bit about your sense of time and, and how that expresses it in the music. Cause you know, if, if you take like some of the early S and D stuff and, and then you compare it to like uh, the infoldings and diffractions release, right. Uh, mm. Very, very different. Sonically the, the connection is, can be made, but Timing wise, there's a real difference there. And and if you listen to kind of your work over time, you see that progressing over time. And I'm curious, what what is that relationship and, and what is the thought process in your mind of dealing with with rhythm and with time? That's a really difficult question. I know. Uh, I know. Um I mean I, I I guess I was just well, I encountered Indian classical music, so like South Indian classical music. Someone said to me, you should really listen to this stuff, Mark. And I was like, well, yeah, you know, I've heard it on the radio and it's kind of nice and whatever. And then and then I got a record. I think I got, a, I think this friend who said you should listen to it gave me some records. And I was like, oh, wow, this is like really amazing. And then I went to a, a kind of summer solstice event of like all night. So basically starts at sunset and ends at sunrise. Mm-hmm. And actually it was Ryan's birthday and I was... He was living in Leeds and there was like this thing. And I was like, Ryan, let's go to this for your birthday. I've never seen Indian classical music live before. And it was like basically one of those mind blowing things of like, oh my God, there's like, I just really feel this is what, this is, this is the music that I'm into. You know, it's like, it just, it just, crikey, this is great. And I've never liked Western classical music. I actually find it almost unlistenable. And that's my problem. I'm not saying it's bad. I, I've just got a problem with it that it's like I, I can't actually bear listening to most Western classical music. And what I like about Indian classical music is that it's it's an explore for me. I, I hear this exploration of like the interlocking of rhythms and very basic elements. You know, also maybe because it's because I'm not Indian. You know. My res- my relationship to it is like it's not about my emotional response to it. You know, it's kind of quite dry in that sense that it's just a kind of, yeah, because it's outside my cultural or it occupies a different relationship to me in terms of its, you know, its cultural kind of position. I, I wasn't, hmm. you know, I didn't grow up in, in that culture. That's interesting because while it might not, while it might not have an emotional draw, 
I would think that there's something that's, that goes beyond just a pure intellectual draw. Because if nothing else, rhythm has sort of like a physical component to it, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there's an aesthetic. It's not like I'm saying it was just a kind of formalist exercise. Right, you know? right. But anyway, it just it just appealed to I just felt like, okay, I get this, you know. Uh-huh. And then I I went to India and met people and started to learn about Indian class the South Indian version of uh Indian classical music, Carnatic music, and especially about the rhythmic elements, which is it's a thing called a tala, which is like a very simple system that produces incredible complexity. You know, I was lucky to meet people who were from that world and we became really good friends and we still, still, you know, work together and in touch and stuff. So that was a big, you know, that was an important thing for me. And also it was, it was a step outside the electronic music world as well. Mm -hmm. I've always been kind of quite aesthetically, uh, how can I put this? Perhaps too focused. So it's like, I remember when like, like I first got into like North American house music in the early 90s, there was this moment when people stopped you. It got trendy not to use hand claps, but to use finger snaps instead. And I was like, okay, I'm not going out anymore because I cannot bear being in a club <laughs> where there's a deep house record and it's got bloody finger snaps on. Do you know what I mean? Right, and, right. And like I was just like completely aesthetically immobile if you see what i mean yeah and so yeah. It, it would it was important for me to just break out of that and not be so childish i guess because that as a kid that's that was it was almost like that kind of focus got me through but then as you become an adult when i, I didn't become an adult till i was about 40 i think <laughs> it's, it's like you, you you know it's like okay you can kind of let go of that a bit and just start to be a bit more uh, you know, not so narrow-minded. And, you know, actually meeting people, like meeting guitarists like Oren and Barchi and Stephen O'Malley and, like, hanging out with them. And it's like, at one, you know, 20 years ago, if you'd said I was hanging out with the guitarist, I would have been like, no way on earth. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm never going to be friends with any guitarist. You can forget that. So, you know, it's like, and I remember, like, talking to Stephen and he was like, I was like, what, so you into, like, Iron Maiden and stuff like that. I can't believe that anyone's into Iron Maiden and and Ozzy Osbourne. He's like, yeah, Mark. I when you know when I was a kid, that was my throbbing gristle. You know, right? That right. was the thing, and it was like, whoa, yeah. So anyway, but yeah, that's what we're talking about. Time, time. That's, that's interesting. Well, you know, you talk about some of these collaborations, whether it's whether it's the South Indian. Uh, the people who understood South Indian music that introduced you to that. Um, or if I look over your your work, you've done a lot of interesting ca- collaborations, collaboration with Matt for SND, but a lot of stuff even, um, you know, once you started doing solo releases, a lot of your kind of quote solo releases are actually uh, in combination with other people, right, in collaboration. What is it that... that collaborations do for you and how do you search out the people that you're going to collaborate with well one thing about collaborations is when things get difficult you've got someone else to fall back on mm, right. so it's like like i remember i did a a record with sasu rapati i was struggling i was like oh god and sasu was just like hang on a minute just let me have a go and it's like Oh wow, he's really, really knows what he's doing with this. And you know, it's like, thank God, you know, I couldn't have done that. And he just right. and the same, you know, with with I did a thing with Aerosmith, and it was like, you know, when the going got too tough for me, I was like, okay, I'm just I'm on the sofa. I'm really like, and and Eric would kind of, you know, have that extra energy of bringing it together. And and so there's that that like, you know, you've got someone else to help and you've got support and and then the other thing is it's just it's just nice hanging out with people. Like I'd rather be in a studio with some other people and then you know you've the sessions done and you go for food and you're having a laugh. And like a really good one was this thing I did with Oren and Barchi and Will Guthrie and Osama Shalabi. We did this project called Oglong Day. And it was just for two days we were just just joking the whole time and it was just really good fun you know 
And actually, most of my social life is through work. I don't really have friends that are just normal friends, you know. <laughs> I'm like, like um, so I kind of rely on on work to have a kind of social life. And then, and then also, it's just like right now, I'm working with this ensemble. Yesterday, I was working with this pianist, and just to like learn what it what a bit of what it is to be a pianist you know it's like oh god like i like there's this thing and you can do this with the sustain pedal or there are these concerns or you know just just the complexity of how that whole world functions that was completely unknown to me before you know so um, now when you're working with i mean you talked before about like not only this ensemble you're doing uh you're working with now but uh, you've done a couple of album releases, uh, I think particularly of like the Intra album, where you're working with where you're working with acoustic musicians. How do you convey your work to them? I mean, uh, you know, I think of you as being a laptop person has got like weird algorithmic things happening in Max MSP. It's not like you can show the patch to a to a pianist to, to yeah. have them work it out. How do you convey your work to have them perform it? Well, each time I do it, it's different. Like yesterday, the pianist said to me, like, you know, she's brilliant. And and this isn't a criticism of her. Of her. She was like, I don't really know what we're doing. It's just a bit, conf I'm confused. And I was like, yeah, I am as well. Yeah. I was like, but, and and then the and then the leader of this ensemble was like, so what are we going to do? How are we going to get out of this? And I was like, I don't know. We're just going to keep doing stuff and see what happens, you know? And so the methodology comes out through the process of the encounter you know and then from that comes some work but like so there isn't a kind of preset sort of way of doing anything and i think that's what appeals to me that every encounter is new and and even the people with this this within this ensemble so i've worked with three of them so far and we're working individually at this point mm -hmm. each one is completely different you know right and what i've realized is i'm not really so, you know, to them, I'm the composer or I'm the director or whatever. But to me, I feel much more like a coach or something. You know, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm the one controlling everything. I feel like, you know, and surely I have got a, an authority or something that I, I can't deny, but it feels to me that I'm much more in a position of like responding to what I'm getting from them, if you see what I mean. But yeah, like when we did the interest stuff, so Ryan was there as well and we were in their studio for for a few days trying stuff. I think one important thing for me is to get over the kind of boredom barrier, to get to a place where boredom doesn't count anymore. Do you see what I mean? Like for a lot of these, for a lot of performers, like these guys, the, the percussion guys from Porto, it was like they were a bit sort of surprised by just how little I wanted them to do, if you see oh, what I mean. Oh, I see. Right, okay. It's like, and it's like, we don't have to kind of be constantly aware of the audience might get bored, you know. Like my job, I feel like my job is to get the audience through that boredom threshold into a place where, like, boredom exists because you're constantly trying to entertain people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, it explains your your, like, innate distaste of classical music. Yeah, yeah. And and obviously there are people within that contemporary classical frame. They're pushing the envelope in that, right, yeah. Especially like the minimalists of the mid-20th century in New York and stuff were doing that. But yeah, it's like, I think getting to that point where, it, also this is the lesson I learned with SND, that, you know, you don't have to have all these kind of like frilly bits of like, oh, we've got some space, so let's put that in there and let's put that. <laughs> you know, it, it is what it is and just deal with it, you know. There are people who don't like that, but but I think at some point you kind of cross that threshold of like where boredom isn't a consideration anymore. Because right. I do think but people just get bored because they're constantly bombarded with things that just are changing all the time. You know, like right. we want we want a film like this where every shot lasts three seconds and there's dialogue everywhere and there's, you know, and it's like, but let's have things that last a bit longer and let's have some silence in there and some space and just get used to it, you know, just get 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 over it. And right. then I think that's that's important. When when you listen to music for yourself then, 
what do you listen to? And, and, and maybe more important, evenly, where do you listen? I mean, are you a person who listens when you're driving around or when you wear headphones when you go for a walk? Do you have like a listening room at your house where you sit back and enjoy or do you avoid listening to music in general? I, different people have different kind of responses to that. I'm, I'm really curious. Well, I don't drive. This is, this is, I guess, really unusual for someone in America to find that, like, there's an adult who doesn't drive. Right. But, like, I don't drive, so, and I walk around a hell of a lot. Like, so I, we live near the Peak District in the north of England. It's, it's a big national park. Okay. So I'm out there the whole time. And the thought of wearing headphones and listening to music while I'm out there is horrific. Like, there's, there's a weird thing that happens when you're in when you're out in somewhere very still and remote that your whole kind of your sense of hearing sort of changes you know you become aware of the silence and i think even if i went out there with someone if i took a friend out there and they put headphones on i'd actually be offended by that <laughs> right sure i'd be like stop filling it with nonsense but having said that, I do listen to music loads. And so, you know, a really brilliant radio station, NTS. Do you, do you know this? this London I don't, based no. NTS. So we tend to have NTS on the whole time. Is that NTS or N? NT. So that's on quite a lot in our house. And the, that's a really great way of encountering new music because basically the people that present the shows are just like, you know, I'm the kind of jazz freak or whatever, or I'm mm-hmm. the, and it's just really great to actually. This, this guy Greg Davis, do you know Greg Davis? Is I know him. Yes, I haven't met him. Yeah, he he did a with someone else did a show, an Indian classical music show, and we listened to that a hell of a lot. Oh, oh interesting. Um, and then, because I'm caring for my elderly parents and my mum's got dementia, music's a really important thing for her. So we tend to listen to a lot of. She loves dub reggae. Oh, interesting! Kind of like oh, wow. quite, quite un, unusual, I guess. So we listen to a lot of, a lot of Lee Scratch Perry. Well, um, congratulations! Because all the el- elderly parents that I care for, all they want to listen to is freaking Fox News. So good on you yeah. for having uh, yeah. having a good taste profile there. I think I've got unusual parents. Like they work, you know, they're very working class from extremely poor backgrounds, uh-huh. built with nothing, but. I don't know what it was, but like, I think somehow before I was born, they kind of, you know, they're not kind of hippies or anything. They, they just kind of have, I think they just have this alternative set of values that came from somewhere. But yeah, also in addition to dub reggae, my mum likes Hawaiian guitar. So we listen to loads of Hawaiian guitar and jazz, you know, she likes jazz. She grew up in Leeds, which is quite a cosmopolitan city in the north of England and the in the fifties, you know, jazz was a big thing. I see. So, um, interesting. So yeah, we listen to a lot of music in this house and we, we also play a lot of music. So like, we've got lots of instruments around. I don't play anything, but I make sound on it. I have a, <laughs> um, I, I recently bought, uh, what is it called? The, the kind of dulcimer or Santo. So recently I had one made in, in Tehran and got it shipped over and that arrived. So we, you know, just things like that. Like the house is constantly full of music, basically. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, well, man, I want to thank you uh, for your time. I, I look at the clock and we have way shot over our time. I appreciate your, your discussion. So this is really fabulous and really, uh, really inspiring. Thank you so much for that. Thanks. And I hope it was, yeah. Oh, it was awesome. I, I could have tried harder, I think. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that, we'll say goodbye. Damn, I always have a great time when I talk to Mark. Uh, I want to thank him so much for taking the time to have this discussion, and thanks to you for taking the time to listen. Uh, I learned a lot. I hope you did, too. Um, If you are into it, please make sure that you uh, check out 
All the stuff that's going on on my Patreon, that's patreon.com slash Darwin Gross, D-A-R-W-I-N-G-R-O-S-S-E. And if you have any uh, comments, concerns, questions, or you just want to chat, drop me a line. It's ddg at cycling74.com, darwin.gross at gmail.com, or ddg at 20objects.com. Thanks a lot for listening, and we'll catch you next time around. Bye.